So I apologize for having uh, missed Monday's class. We're going to sort of continue exactly what way we would have continued on Monday. And I'm hoping to record what should nominally have been today's class later because uh, the, I, we need to get caught up by next week with our, with our schedule. So uh, we were speaking about convolutional neural networks. And uh, where we'd left off was we'd seen how we saw how everything got put together, but we hadn't yet gotten over, uh, gotten through how the things are trained and uh, what variations there might exist to these models. So what we will be covering today in brief is this. We'll go through a quick recap of what we've done so far. And then we'll look at back propagation through convolutional neural networks, through uh, uh, scaling, rotation, and deformation and fair invariance, and some, uh, uh, some of the applications of uh, the model that we have seen lately, but we won't spend a lot of time on it. We're going to be spending time mostly on backdrop and the invariances. The class may end early if I run out of material. I was expecting before, you know, before I checked the weather. I was expecting there'd be more people in class, so there'd be more questions towards the end of the topic. We're going to we're going to close with CNNs today. We will briefly revisit it after a few lectures when we've done recurrent neural networks to talk about a specific kind of uh, convolutional networks called transformers, but that will be in a few lectures. So the story so far, we've seen that pattern classification tasks such as does this picture contain a cat or does this recording contain the word hello are best performed by scanning for the target pattern. And scanning an input with a network and combining the outcomes is equivalent to scanning with individual neurons uh, hierarchically. We saw that. So the first level uh, neurons would scan the input. Higher level neurons scan the maps formed by the lower level neurons. Then you, have, you, you can have a final decision unit or layer to take the final decision. And uh, some level of deformation in the info input can be handled by pooling. For two-dimensional and higher dimensional scans, the structure we said was a convolutional network, and for 1D scan a long time, this was a time delay neural network. So here was the general architecture of the network that we saw. It comprises uh, convolutional layers and optional downsampling layers. And finally, when we are done with all of the uh, convolutional layers and the downsampling layers, towards the end, you could take the output of the last layer, flatten it out, and treat that as a representation of the input that could be passed through a decision unit or maybe a whole, an entire multi-layer perceptron. So uh, the two key components over here were the convolutional layers and the pooling layers. Now here's what we said the convolutional layer looked like. So a convolution layer consists of several activation maps. And each activation map has two components. We have the linear component which is obtained by, scan, by convolving or scanning over the maps in the previous layer, followed by an activation function that operates on the output of this convolutional scan. And here is what the uh, convolution looked like, if you will recall. We have the notion of a filter, which may or may not have a bias. The filter is basically just the neuron. And the pattern of weights of the filter is effectively the pattern that the neuron is scanning for on its input, and it would literally scan. So here's what we saw. In our case, we have this image, which is a bunch of binary values to the right, the green thing. And the filter, our filter was uh, this little three by three filter, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And we would lay the filter on top of the image, do a component by component multiply, and add the lot. So when the filter is positioned to the top left, the large numbers are the actual underlying number, the underlying image, and the little red numbers to the, to the bottom right in each box represent the filter. So you'd be multiplying the back black number by the red number in each of the boxes and adding the lot. That result you will see is going to be four. So that's the outcome at the top left corner. And then as you scan this, if this works, you can see at each position you will get an output. And so this was what the convolve feature looked like. 
Now, this is a simplification of the entire story in that we are showing what happens when you convolve a map with a filter, but in reality, we saw that uh, what you're really going to, what you actually have are several maps as the output of the previous layer, and your filter is going to comprise a k cross k pattern or several k cross k pattern, one per map. So in this case, we have several maps in one layer, and the filters are all three cross three filters, but when I say three cross three filters, it really means three cross three per plane. And so the actual output that you get uh, in the little gray box to the right, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, top right, is going to be the sum of the component wise multiplications of the filter parameters with the corresponding uh, values on the plane underneath. So uh, you would get one value out here, the top right, then you'd slide the whole filter out by one step, and then again perform a component by component multiplication of the filter values with the corresponding uh, map values underneath, sum them up, and so on. And so this was the entire operation that we would actually perform to get one map. And this is just one filter. So what really happens is that you have several such filters. Each of these filters is performing exactly the same operation, and you're going to get several maps. And this was the, uh, this was the uh, entire convolutional operation. So we could actually view the operation of one filter in 3D as we saw, where instead of thinking, laying the maps one on top, one above the other, if we stack, stack them up into a 3D object, then you could think of the filter itself also as a uh, little cuboid. And what we are really performing, doing, is laying the filter on this three-dimensional object representing the image. And now within that little rectangular, this, this cuboid that I've shown, we would, be, we would perform a component by component multiplication and sum them up to get a single number. And this is the scan that you perform to, to obtain the complete output. The equation below shows the actual operation being performed. Now this is important. We will see, we'll, we'll get into this. Uh, we will uh, need to uh, have a clear idea of what's happening in this case because we will encounter it again later. That cube, the rectangular cube, is a filter. This filter is searching for a pattern. So in order to compute the output map, output of the convolution at any location, we are positioning this filter, we are shifting this filter to a specific location in the input map. And in that shifted position, we are computing a component-wise multiplication, and then we are adding them all up, right? So do you mind shutting your laptop, please? Thanks, right? So this is the operation that we are performing for the convolution, right? And that gave us the entire map. So uh, here was the little uh, pseudocode. Those of you who are big on your homeworks have probably implemented some version of this already, that for each layer in the uh, connet, if you're looking at only the convolutions, for each filter, you're scanning through the input, and at each location, the segment is this 3D tube in the input, this 3D cuboid from the input. You, you overlay the filter on top of this cuboid, perform a tensor in a product, which is the sum of component-wise multiplies, right? And we also saw this, that the convolution doesn't have to stride forward by one pixel at a time. It can be striding forward by more than one pixel, in which case your output map is actually going to have, uh, output map is actually going to shrink. So uh, the effect of con convolving with strides is to shrink the map. If you were convolving without strides, ignoring edge effects, the, with a stride of one, the result of the convolution is going to be the same as the, as the size of the uh, original map itself. If the stride is greater than one, the result of the convolution is going to, be sh going to be smaller. And it's going to be smaller by a factor that really is just the stride. So uh, here is the uh, little pseudocode for uh, convolving with a stride at each position. I should have brought my clicker. So uh, at, uh, we are sort of starting from the top left corner, x, y equals 1. 
and then the filter is striding forward, moving forward by one stride length at a time to compute the output. So as you can see, the indices of the Zs and the Ys inside the loop are, the, are different from the indices of the original image. The, I, the Is and the Js are going, sorry, the Ms and the Ns are going to take far fewer values than the X and the Ys, right? We saw a different method also for shrinking the maps, which was, which was uh, uh, downsampling or pooling. So in the case of pooling, and, and these pooling maps could either alternate with the convolutional maps or occur intermittently. And in the latest architectures, we don't use them at all. But uh, uh, in pooling, here's what we do. We sort of look at a little rectangle, a little patch of inputs. And if you're performing max pooling, you're going to take the largest from the pool of elements and position it at the output. So here, for example, if you're looking at those four squares, those four, those, those, four, those four values, which are covered by the white patch, if those values were three, one, four, and six, the largest value is six. So the output that you're going to compute is the value six. And then you'd, you'd perform this as a scan, exactly as before, right? So this was the max pooling. And it's also called, now, when you perform max pooling, typically you stride forward by more than one pixel at a time, more than one element at a time. So as a result, the output is, all, is going to be smaller than the input, which is why we call this downsampling, in, the, in that from each pool of elements, you're picking a value and then sliding on. And so as a result, you're sort of sampling, downsampling the image to get a smaller image. So this is, so, so is downsampling. And so if you actually saw the uh, pseudocode for max pooling, which we didn't actually show last time, so here's what you're going to look, uh, here's what you're going to see. You're striding forward, striding through the input map in strides of side to size stride. But then in the operations, you will note that I've actually split the operation into operations into two steps. One is the PIDX step, which actually identifies the location of the largest value within the patch. And in the second step, we're just copying the value at this location into the output map. So it's a two-step process. The first one is identifying the location of the maximum, and the second step is copying this value into the, into, into the output. And this, this two-step process is important because if we just combine both and simply picked up the max, we will not be able to backpropagate errors later. So this two-step process actually is essential for backpropagation. We also saw a different kind of pooling. You may not pick up the max, you can also pick up the mean of the map that you see. So here, for example, if, you are, if you're, you're still downsampling, you're still going to be sort of pooling all the values within this block that you're seeing to get a single value and then striding by, by more than one pixel so that the output is, again, smaller than before. But we're replacing the max operation by a different one, which is the mean. So in the case of the means, say those four values that you're looking at are three, one, four, and six. There are four values. The sum over here is uh, 14, so 14 divided by 4 is 3.5. So the output value is going to be 3.5. This is just the mean, right? So if I were to write the pseudocode for mean pooling, observe over here, this is very much like the code for max pooling with one difference. Now I don't have the extra line which is identifying the location of the maximum. We're just computing the mean of the patch and copying it over. So when we set everything together in a typical, say, image classification task, and say if, if I were assuming max pooling, we saw here's what uh, we would get. Perhaps you're trying to uh, learn whether, de de learn to detect if an image has a house. So the typical image is going to be uh, not just grayscale, it's actually going to be RGB, right? And so what we would do is stack those images. So now we have a stack of planes. When you have R, G, and B, this is identical to having, in, in uh, perspective, to having multiple maps within each layer. So R, G, and B are different maps or channels, as we call them, uh, in the terminology. So you can stack them together into a cube. Uh, and then your filters, you would have K1 filters in the first level. Each of these filters are going to scan the input 
So each of these filters is going to create an output map. So if you have K1 filters, you're going to have K1 output maps, which you can stack together to form the second cube, but now the second cube is not three deep anymore. It's K1, K1 deep. And then the second, and then you could potentially, you could optionally downsample those, uh, that map, the Y maps using pooling. So you're going to get a smaller size map, which is obtained through say max pooling or mean pooling. And then the second, the downsample maps are also going to be K, uh, uh, K1 wide. Now, here is something that I sort of glossed over when we were going through this pooling. Both for max pooling, and when we were actually performing the convolution, the convolution filter, each convolution filter was looking across the entire stack of images. So you were looking at the entire stack of images, the filter was a cuboid. When you're performing max pooling, you're performing max pooling or mean pooling individually for each of the planes. So here, for example, uh, in this, so as you stride through, you're sort of fixing the plane and the actual pooling is looking over a, over a rectangle of values within the plane and either picking the max or the mean. So now the max and mean pooling are being are performed separately by plane. So what this means is that the output of pooling is going to have exactly as many planes as the input of the pooling operation. So the pooling, so the pooling output here too, after the first layer is going to have K1 uh, planes. And then you would have a second set of filters, say you have K2 filters operating on the output of the pooling. And now the result of operating on that with K2 filters is that you're now, now going to get K2 planes. And so the output is going to be a cuboid with K2 planes where each, each plane is approximately the same size as the U plane, which was the, which was the uh, previous layer. And then you could perform a pooling on that to shrink its size and repeat these operations several times. Eventually, when you get to the end of these convolution operations, you would flatten the output and pass it through, say, a multi-layer perceptron to get your final classification output. Now, we saw all of this in the last class. The question we left off with is, OK, we know how to put everything together. We know what each of these operations are. How do we actually learn the parameters to perform a specific task. So if I want to, if I want to recognize flowers, or if I want to detect, learn, identify the class of the input, then clearly all of these parameters must be chosen to perform this specific, or this, this specific task. How exactly do I choose them? Now, what are all the parameters to learn over here? We have convolution operations, we have pooling operations, and then we have the final after flattening, we have, we have the final MLP. So we're going to have to learn the parameters. All the, all, now, the learnable parameters over here are obviously the parameters of the MLP. Pooling really comes with no parameters. If you're just picking a max, there are, there are no magic numbers to picking a max. I have a collection number of numbers, I must pick a max. If I'm computing a mean, I have a collection of numbers, I must compute a mean. So there are no uh, parameters to compute for pooling. Now, if you go back uh, a couple of lectures, you'll recall we spoke about uh, uh, S planes and C planes. So the pooling is the equivalent of the C plane in, uh, in Fukushima's neocognitron model. Again, there are no learnable parameters over there. Now, the convolution, on the other hand, has all of these filters. Every filter is a collection of numbers. It's a cuboid of numbers. These numbers must be learned. And so uh, the uh, the parameters that we have to learn are all those that are encircled by the ellipse, the parameters of the MLP, the parameters of the cubes up there, and the parameters of the cubes to the left. Right? And this is what we really have to learn. Now, training here is pretty much exactly how you would train uh, a regular MLP. The primary difference is in the structure of the network. But the procedure is the same. You're going to be given training examples, image and images and class labels. And then we would define a divergence between the desired output and the true output of the network in response to any input. And the network parameters are trained through variants of gradient descent, where gradients are computed through backpropagation. So uh, 
here's the first step, of course, is that we have to define a loss. So you have the output of the network right here, the y's, for any given input x. And then for the given input x, you also have a target output, what you want the output to be, which is the d of x, using the standard notation that we've been using. And we can define a divergence between the two, which is the divergence between the actual output of the network and the target output of the network for that specific input. So here is the problem set up again. You wouldn't be given just one training input. You're going to be given collections of inputs, several images and their labels, for instance. And each of these is going to be passed through the network, resulting in an output. And then for each of these, you can compute a divergence. You compute the average divergence over this collection of inputs. And this is what you're going to try to minimize with respect to the parameters of the network, which are namely the parameters of the filters and any biases that, may, the, that the filters might carry. So this is, again, the same idea as before. The total training error is the, or the average training error is the average divergence over all of the training instances. And so we will use a gradient descent algorithm where we will iteratively update every parameter which is going to be, which is for every, every layer, for every filter. Now filters have a span x and y, right? So uh, this is the w's are missing an index over here. But for every layer, for every filter, the filter is actually a three dimensional object. So it's going to have three indices. And for each of these indices, you're going to use the derivative of the divergence with respect to that value and adjust the filter, right? So this term is what we really want to compute. We need to know how to compute this, this derivative. And this, deriva the de this is the derivative of the error, total or the average error with respect to the parameter, which can be decomposed into the average of the derivatives of the divergences for the individual inputs with respect to the parameter. So this term is what we really want to estimate, right? And so, how do we compute all of this? Now, firstly, I'm going to assume that we already know how to perform backpropagation through a, uh, through a standard flat multi-layer perceptron. So, you have the trailing end of that network with the output y, and the output y has a divergence with respect to whatever target output there is for this particular input. You can compute the derivatives through the flat layers all the way to the input of the last flat layer. Or now keep in mind, or, or at least the output of the last, last flat, or of the first flat layer. So now keep in mind that that first flat layer is simply just a flattening of the last output of the convolutional, convolutional portion of the network. So what we really did was we had all of these guys, we had these planes, right? And we sort of straightened them out. We just sort of took strips and laid them one on top of the other and, and concatenated the lot. So when we did this, if my back propagation gives me the divergences at this location, going backwards, then it tells me, then I can actually rearrange these back into this shape and so I now have the divergences at the output of the final convolutional layer after having back propagated through the, uh, through the uh, MLP. The MLP can be as simple as just a simple, uh, uh, simple softmax unit, or it could even just be an L2 over a mean. It can be, it can be the, file, the MLP could be as complex or, or as simple as you want it to be. But at the end of the day, when you're performing back propagation, when you come all the way through the MLP, you're going to actually have the divergences at the output of the final convolutional layer. So what you will get is the term I've written in the box up there, which is the divergence, the, uh, the derivative of the divergence with respect to YL, which where YL is the output of the Lth or the final layer of the convolutional network. And so now, that must be that derivative must be back propagated through all the convolutional layers and all the pooling layers. 
So the question, so our question is now, how do we actually backpropagate through convolutional layers and pooling layers, which are obviously not your standard MLP, right? So you have to take two things, concerned. you have to consider two things. Firstly, in the case of the convolution layers, they share, there's a lot of shared computation. A single value can affect many, multiple outputs, and a single output could have been affected by multiple inputs. So this must be taken, taken into consideration when you compute the derivative. When you're performing the pooling, you have a different, different uh, problem. You have a collection of inputs, and particularly when you're performing max output, only one of them changed the, affected the output when you're, when you're performing max pooling, and this must be considered. So let's consider uh, computing the derivatives past the convolutional layer in the first place. So for every Lth layer filter, Lth layer map, remember, in every layer you have several maps, each map has been produced using one filter, right? So for every Lth layer filter, each position in the map of the L minus one layer affects several of the outputs in the Lth layer. So, so here, for example, if you observe this carefully, if you pick any particular block in the green figure, you can see that its value actually affects several of the values, of several of the pink values, right? And this must be considered when you are uh, taking the uh, derivative. And of course, the entire process of convolution has two steps. First, you perform the convolution, so you get this map, and then you apply an activation to every posi position individually on the map to get an output, right? So if I'm going to be, so there are three terms that I have to compute, that, that I have to worry about, when I'm computing my derivatives. There is the output of the Lth layer. There's the affine combination. The output of the convolution is simply the affine combination that goes into the activation. So there's the affine combination at the Lth layer. This goes through the activation to give you the output. And there's the output of the L minus oneth layer, which is what is being convolved up, uh, by the filters to give you the affine combination at the Lth layer, right? So if I have to compute my derivatives, I have to work my way backwards. I'll be coming from wherever the network ended, taking the derivatives of the divergences all the way to the output of the Lth layer. And then you're going to take a step back. And from there, you're going to compute the derivative with respect to the affine combination for the Lth layer. And then from there, you're going to take a step back and compute a derivative with respect to the output of the L minus, L minus oneth layer. And somewhere in between, you're also going to be computing the derivative with respect to the weights, right? And of the filter. Now, all of this is going to be possible because we begin by assuming that we already have the derivatives with respect to the output of the final layer. So let's, take, let's look at the first part of, the, of this, which is how do you get, I'm assuming that you have the derivative with respect to YL, how do you go from the derivative with, with respect to YL to the derivative with respect to ZL? This is fairly straightforward, right? Uh, we uh, know this. This is just a component-wise application of an activation. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to ZL is simply going to be The derivative of the divergence with respect to ZL is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to YL times the derivative of the activation function itself computed at the current ZL position. This is just like the standard uh, MLP backprop, right? The more interesting one, so this is easy. It's a component-wise uh, differentiation. There's no magic happening over here. The more complex pen is when you go let's take a step back, how do you compute the derivative with respect to the output of the previous layer given the current affine combinations? And here, you have to keep in mind that each y position in the L minus one layer affects several z's in the Lth layer, and each z in the Lth layer is affected by several y's in the L minus one layer. So to convince yourself, consider 
just this one little square, the one that I've encircled with a bright uh, red square, and look at all of the positions in the output that it actually affects. So if I do this, you can see which are the ones it actually affects. Keep track of which are the ones. That, so the way you do it is, is you have to keep track of whether the filter is actually sitting on the red box when the particular output is being computed. And you can see over here immediately that this little red box affects those four outputs in the map, right? So in terms of derivatives, it means that any, any changes in, this, in the value within the red box is going to affect those four outputs. So you're going to have, when you compute the derivatives backward, you're going to have to compute the contribution of all four terms. Or for example, consider this guy, right? Now this guy, so, but then so, but then it's not so simple, right? It's not just one map. Remember, you're actually operating with many different filters. Each filter is producing a different output map. So what really happens is that every single filter, Lth level filter, is going to produce a map, and that value, that box, uh, that that uh, little uh, boxed value in the red square affects all of these values across all the maps. And we have to consider all of these when you actually compute the derivative. Or here's another example, consider this guy. Now, the shape and the, and the location of the region which gets affected by any specific position really depends on where it is, right? So consider this particular location, the, the one in the very center. And if you look at that carefully, you will see that it affects the entire output map, right? So that value gets accounted for, gets considered in producing every single output in this output map. And in fact, it's going to be considered when producing every single output at the, uh, of every single map, right? So now when I want to compute the derivatives, uh, I have sort of made the mistake of skipping the, deleting the, or hiding the slides, which actually have the equations, the equations are fairly straightforward. I didn't want to bore you in the early morning with equations, so I'll post fresh slides with equations and show you how these things actually work. There's a little trick where indices get, get reversed, and uh, explaining how indices get reversed at nine in the morning on a, is guaranteed to put everybody to sleep. But it turns out that you don't have to worry about equations in this particular, when you, when you think about it. We can use a very simple trick and for that, I will show you how we can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to that little value that has been circled and include the contributions of all of the terms that it affects. Now for this, we will start off by looking at the forward code and we'll get motivated by the forward code. Here's a very simple trick. We can apply this trick pretty much anywhere in this kind of computation, right? So. This is the standard forward code. You are going through the layers. Within each layer, you are going through all of the filters. For each filter, you are scanning the previous layer, and you're scanning the previous layer with your filter where you're taking, a where, where you're taking an inner product between the filter and a cor the corresponding cuboid of the previous layer. And so the inner product, in turn, has been expanded out just to be, uh, just to be very explicit because this is where you actually see what is happening, right? And the inner product has been expanded out to say that if I'm over here, so if these are my maps, and I place the filter over here, now the filter is going to be, have a component on each map, right? So you're going to be going across the breadth and the width of the filter. So you're going over X prime and Y prime, which are across the breadth and the width of the filter. And then across all of the filters, you're going to be multiplying the, the Y value underneath by the filter value at that position. So here, for example, if this is X, Y, then add, you also get a contribution from here, which is going to be x plus x prime, y plus y prime, 
on the map, but x prime, y prime on the filter, right? So the the uh, the uh, two indices are have different starting points. So the terms that guy get multiplied. If you look at the y, that is with that is with respect to the origin for the image itself, which is here. And so for y, you have y x plus x prime, and y plus y prime. But for the filter, it is with respect to this point, which is the filter. And so you have the filter x prime, y prime, right? Nothing fancy. And then we've just taken the component-wise multiplication and added over the lot. And now, here is something very interesting that I can tell you. If I have any y equals ax, then I can for any f, I can say uh, dy over df over dy is going to be uh, d, d x is going to be df over dy times dy over dx, right? So, which is going to, which implies that df over dy equals dx equals df over dy times a. We are not doing anything fancy. This is something that we're all the standard chain rule, correct? So now look at the three terms over here within the entire inner loop. So within the inner loop, what are the terms we've got? We have z equals w times y. It's actually z plus equals w times y, but, but a specific contribution it, it is z equals w times y, right? So I can say the divergence, derivative of the divergence with respect to y is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z times w, correct? Just using the straight up chain rule. I can also say the derivative of the divergence with respect to w is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z times, the times y, right? I'm using the same equation twice. And this is all that I need to know, right? So now if I take this equation, and if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to y, right? I'm speaking of y l minus 1. I already have the derivative of the divergence with respect to z l, because z l follows y l minus 1, right? What is the relationship of the derivatives between the two going to be? It's just this. The derivative of the divergence with respect to y is derivative with respect to z times w, right? Derivative with respect to w is going to be derivative with respect to, times, to z times y. So I haven't done anything. I'm going to use the same code. I just flipped the arrangement of what was on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equals. So just, to, just take a close look here again. Here, this was z equals w times y, right? So the derivative with respect to y equals w times the derivative with respect to z. The derivative with respect to w is the derivative, with, with, uh, is the derivative of z times y. I've just used this simple rule within the code. No fancy, nothing fancy. You don't have to worry too much about how the arithmetic works out. You can be guaranteed that this is right. Yeah? So, but then you have to take a take. To, you have, I haven't changed anything. I haven't changed the indices. I have changed nothing at all. All I have done is, is flip, the, flip, the, uh, flip the equation to write the derivatives in the innermost loop, and everything works. The one, one difference is that we're using plus equals plus and plus equals simply because we know that each z term is affected by many y's. And therefore, each y term is going to be there affected by many z's. 
each z term is affected by many w's, so each w term is going to be affected by many z's, right? So if you look at what, what we've done over here, we've actually first initialized all the derivatives with respect to both w and y to zero. And then as you go through the loop, you just, keep, you just sort of increment by the contributions of the individual terms. That is all we really need to do, right? So, and of course, this is written in a nice loopy way. There are multiple ways of recasting this as tensor and vector operations. I'm not going to go over those. I'll post some slides on it. But any, any, any questions about this, right? There's, not, there's nothing particularly complicated over what we did. I could have worked my way through the arithmetic, and I promise you that you would have, it would have left your head spinning. But when I just write it in terms of code and break it down to the simplest operation and flip things, you can see how it works. It's really very trivial. Right? Questions? No. Can somebody monitor Piazza, please? I mean, I don't know if there's... Uh, Roshan, can you take a look at Piazza? I'll just be... And anyway, now, of course, in your standard, if you're doing convolution with strides, nothing really changes. What, if you're doing convolution with strides, what you would do is you would have the forward equation, you would, you would have this forward loop with strides, right? And so the backward loop is going to use the same thing as the forward loop with strides, except you're going to flip the order of operations. So all I have done here is, when I'm doing this with strides, uh, you, this is basically the same operation as uh, uh, there are bugs on the slides. I've got to fix this. This is basically the same operation as going forward one stride at a time. This is exactly the same as the forward loop with strides, except all I have done over here is flip the relationship between Z, W, and Y and flip the left hand or right hand side to get the derivatives. But otherwise, it's exactly the same. I can just take my forward code as is and flip things in the middle, and everything should just work flip things in the innermost loop, and everything should just work, blind, right? So uh, this is, so we know, I'm assuming there are no questions, right? So, yeah. Correct. You have a bad size also. So You're just basically going to be summing, for the bad size, all we are speaking of over here, over here is the derivative with respect to for one image, right? For a batch, you'll be computing this for, for the entire batch and then averaging over the batch. Okay, so we will take over the volume of the image as well as the batch. Image. For the batch, think of this as the batch as many independent computations, right? And then, but then you'd have to average over the batch. Here, there's no averaging. You're just literally, literally summing things. I've just taken the regular loop and flipped the order of things in the innermost loop. So we're speaking of the mechanics of the individual derivatives, right? And so also the same thing with strides. Now, so we, we've seen how we can compute the derivatives backwards through the convolution layer. What, are, what was the other operation that we performed? This was pooling, right? So how did we do pooling? We, pooling was generally done by considering pools of inputs and you're know, striding forward by a stride. So you actually shrank the output and eventually you got, the output you got was smaller than the input that went in. And uh, so if you're, now we looked at two different kinds of pooling. If you were performing max pooling, you would be picking the largest element in the block. So if you're picking the largest element in the block, there was a two-step process. The two-step process was first you uh, identified the location of the largest element, and in the second step, you actually read the value from the location of the largest element, right? Now, finding the max is not a, the max is not a differentiable operation. The max, so, so you can't just use standard rules of calculus over here. But then you can go back and ask yourself this question. What exactly does a derivative mean? 
what does it mean to take a derivative? So when I say dy over dx, what is it actually telling me? It's, ask, it's answering the question, if I perturb x by a tiny amount, how much does y change by, right? That is, the, that is the interpretation of the derivative. So now let's go back and ask that question about, where is my tester? So let's go back and ask that question about this guy, right? So look at the value one. If I perturb the value one by a little bit, will the output change? No, right? So what will the derivative with respect to one be? Zero. You can ask this about every single element, which is the one element for which the answer won't be zero? The largest one, because changing that is going to change the output, right? So using that semantic of what a derivative really means, it becomes obvious that the way you would actually go perform the derivative is you're going to assign, now when you're coming backwards, the yellow is the output map, right? That's going to be whatever uh, you, are, you get after max pooling. When you're coming backwards, you expect to have all the derivatives in the yellow figure. Now the derivative for the location of six is going to be transferred to this block in the bottom left. And the other three, they do not affect the output. Their derivatives are going to be zero, right? because they have no influence on the output. And so if you're working your way backwards, this is why we had to keep track of which position actually generated the max. If you're working your way backwards, you're going to transfer the derivative to the location of the max, and the rest of the derivatives are gonna stay zero. And so if I'm doing a max pooling, if I'm working my way backwards, this was the standard max pooling layer, right? First you compute the index of the largest position, and then you compute the derivative. Going backwards, it's very simple. You set all of the derivatives to zero initially, and then you just stuff in the derivative that you got backwards into the location of the max. And that's all you're really doing. So code-wise, it's, all of these things are such simple operations that, we, that the arithmetic looks a lot more complicated than the actual, you know, code level operations, as you can see. The mean is even simpler, but it's, but, but it's a little tricky, right? What exactly, if my, my uh, pooling map is looking over a uh, kernel of you know, k cross k, how many entries in all do I have, k squared? So I'm actually dividing, I'm going to be summing all of the terms within the block, and then I'm dividing by k squared, right? Now, if I want to compute the derivative going back, what does the derivative look like? Observe that all four of these values actually affect the, the mean, right? So if you're going back, the, the derivative in the 3.75 location has to be sent back to all four of these values in equal proportions. And which means that whatever derivative you got get out there at the 3.75 location is going to be divided by k squared before it actually gets sent back, right? That's about it, but there's nothing fancy going on over here. So if I were actually, again, the, the code actually has to take care of making sure that you're, you're handling this stride, right? And, but all you're really doing is transferring, this should have been a du, so many bugs, back by, It's one over k squared, so the slider, the, I'll have to fix this. But you're basically transferring this back to uh, all of the uh, contributing elements. But then observe that there's a plus equals, that's because a contributing element may actually contribute to multiple positions if your stride is lesser than the, the window itself. And so if it's contributing to multiple positions, both of them actually end up contributing to the derivative there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Michael. all of these constants can be subsumed into learning rates, right? But the point is that if you want to, uh, you want, at least conceptually, you want to isolate what the, the arithmetic from the update. That's why. 
you, you pick one, right? Because when you're, going, when you're going forward, you're actually going to select an index. And, and uh, the way you think about it, one of them is contributing, not both. Now, it actually gets interesting. Typically, what we do is we just pick, randomly choose one of these locations and say this is it. But in principle, you could be pretending that it's actually an average of all of these guys, in which case you, could share, you would share the derivative over the entire lot in proportion to all of the ones that could potentially contribute. So you know, these are just uh, fairly arbitrary choices over the, of the one over the other, right? Exactly. It's all one over k squared. And can we just operate the same, like the same thing for backwards? There's a small difference between mean pooling and a standard convolution, right? A standard convolution is looking through the entire plane, through the entire image. It's looking over all of the planes simultaneously. So I have a 3D cube, and then the filter is a small 3D cube, which is scanning the input. And the mean pooling, I'm looking at each plane separately. So I have a 2D patch scanning. So operation, you know, conceptually, yeah, they're the same thing. Operation-wise, they're different. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So is it useful to pull across the third dimension to the filter dimension rather than pulling within the images? Uh, question for those on, PR, on the net. Is it, is it useful to pull across the filter dimension? Now, as an operation, it's a perfectly valid operation. Conceptually, what does it mean? Now, think about this. Each plane is effectively looking for a different type of pattern. So if you're pulling across patterns, you're really saying, I want to find the highest pattern that fight. It's not a very semantically meaningful operation. So while you could do it, I doubt it's actually going to give you anything very use, use, useful. That said, you know, the caveat with all of these things is that it may just work, and I may be wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, we've sort of seen how to actually back propagate errors through every one of these layers, the pooling layers, the filters, the, the convolution layers. And so we can go back and learn all of our parameters. We can learn our filters, we can learn our, uh, we can, uh, the, which are what we want to learn and actually transfer the derivatives all the way to the input. And if need be, you can even figure out how to change the input to get a desired output, right? So here's the story so far. Convolutional neural networks are just uh, supervised versions of a computational model of the mammalian vision. We saw this started in the last class. It includes convolutional layers comprising learned filters and downsampling layers. The parameters of this network can be learned through regular backpropagation. Uh, max prop pooling layers must propagate derivatives only over the maximum element in each pool. And the derivatives must sum over appropriate sets of elements and the rest in the convolutional layers to account for the fact that the, uh, the uh, network is in fact a shared parameter network, right? Now in all of this we made, so this is the default model, but we made several assumptions over here. The first assumption that we did is this one, which is that uh, the, subs that the uh, operations either maintain the size of the, the layers or they shrink the size of the layers. Is this really a very reasonable assumption? Not, very, not really, right? You could well have a layer which increases the size, which is to answer the question that you posted on Piazza, right? How do, you, how do you even visualize this? What does this mean? To understand this, it makes sense to go back to the figure that we saw earlier, the one this was posted on Piazza. Remember, we saw this little example where we said, this is the equivalent of scanning with a little, you know, three-step three step scan with an MLP, but this is just a convolutional network, one-dimensional convolutional network. I've, we've shown everything using bars, but let me simplify the diagram a little bit. This is what was that. So each bar contains many kernels. Whenever I have an arrow, every kernel in the, every filter in the lower layer is communicating with every filter that it's being po pointed to. So the, the bar is pointing to the bar, it's a full, uh, a full connection. Every arrow is, it represents a full connection, right? Now this was the figure that we saw. What does it mean to say that I'm actually going to expand the size of the maps 
All that means is this, right? There's nothing magical that happened. Now we know that in an MLP, you can increase and decrease the size of the layers as you want. We do this all the time. And nothing magical happened over here. There's one small difference from a standard MLP. And that has to do with the arrangement and of, 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 the, of the elements and the pattern in which, and the patterns of weights. And to give you a better idea of, of what is of this, let me just remember, see we have three outputs at the second layer, right, or the third layer, and now we have six in the fourth, just to, I just redrawn it like this, to give you a better idea of what really happens here. Now this figure has some symmetry, and what is the symmetry over here? When I draw it like this, every bar in the fourth layer is identical to every other bar in the fourth layer, which means every bar gets inputs from two, from the same arrangement of inputs in the lower layer. In this particular example, every bar in the fourth layer is getting inputs from two adjacent inputs, adjacent bars in the lower layer, right, in the third layer. So there's that level of symmetry. There's a second level of symmetry. When you go upwards, if you look up the, uh, up the network, the pattern of our upgoing weights from every neuron in any bar is identical to the pattern of upgoing weights from the same neuron in any other bar, right? So if you looked at the red circle and say the fourth bar over here, it has these, this blue arrow which represents a pattern of outgoing weights. The red circle in this bar here at the bottom that also has a blue arrow going out. Those two arrows are the same. They are the same pattern of weights, right? So also, if you go to the third row, the one where the, where the number of boxes expands, then here I'm, we actually have six outgoing purple arrows, but each of those arrows is in fact an entire collection of weights. That entire set of weights, that arrangement is going to be identical for every single bar. So you have the symmetry. Now, the, as a result of the symmetry, it just means that the layer above the boxes, above the third layer, the fourth layer, cannot have an arbitrary arrangement. The arrangement of those boxes in the fourth layer must also be symmetric. They must be somehow related, and such that this kind of symmetry is permitted, right? But once you decide that, then look at how the computation can be done. If I was scanning left to right, how would the computation be done? I'd assume that the third layer is now already computed, Right? Then as I go from, the, go from the left, the first guy is going to con partially contribute to those three boxes. Then I go one step for forward, and those three boxes are now filled up because they have all, all possible inputs coming in, but then I have partial contribution to the next three boxes, then I go right, they get filled on. As I go left to right, the entire thing gets filled up. Right? So, but you get the idea of exactly what is happening over here. Correct? Nothing really magical. So this is sometimes called a transposed convolution. Why would you call this a transposed convolution? And now look at what happens. I have YL, if I were writing the uh, equations out for the standard MLP, if I thought of the whole thing as an MLP, right? Then I would be writing ZL is going to be WL times yl minus one, correct? If I have a shrinking layer, then yl is going to have some size, zl is going to have a smaller size, right? So this means my matrix is going to be broader than tall when I'm performing the multiplication. If I have an expansion, then the operation is different. If I have an why do I keep losing the duster? Does anybody see it? Yeah, they had to paint it red or something. Okay. So if I have an expansion, then, what, then YL would be small. Z is going to be tall. What is the shape of the weight metric matrix going to be? It's going to be taller than it's going to be broad, right? So you're going to have something of this kind. This looks like a transpose of this guy. 
if you transpose this equation, you're going to get that equation. So they like to, so they use this terminology to call it a transpose, uh, transpose uh, convolution. But basic, but the basic idea you get, right? Now let me apply this to a 2D case. If I'm going to go up the uh, computation sizes in 2D, what happens? Same thing. This is what we have with the expanding convolution. So I have, say, a 4 cross 4 map. I want to, the next layer is going to be much larger. This is exactly the same thing. Pictorially, it gives you a lot less intuition than the, two, than the 1D case does, but computationally, it's exactly the same as the two-dimensional equivalent. And so uh, typically, what we would do is to, to, because we want to maintain the symmetry, so the easiest way to maintain symmetry is to make sure that the output is map is an, the size of the output map is an integer multiple of the input map. And unless, of course, your filters are odd sized, in which case you'd have a plus one. So here I have an odd size filter, and you can see what the plus one, why the plus one is required. So now you have several maps in the L minus one layer. You're trying to compute one of the maps for the Lth layer. You're going to have a filter, and the filter will have components for every one of the maps in the L minus one layer, right? So here's how you're going to compute that block of the Lth layer. So the red square on the top left of the first map is going to multiply the first square, the entire thing. The red square in the second map is going to multiply the second filter, the second three cross three. The red square in the third map is going to multiply the third three cross three, and you, then you add them all up. And that gives you a final three cross three that you're going to overlay over there, right? And then I can take one step forward. And I know how much to stride by because the output map, I know the expansion of the output map with respect to the input map, right? And so I'm going to perform the same computation. And then the resulting three cross three I'm going to place on the, after the stride, the overlap regions are going to get added up. And so I can keep repeating this operation. Now I can take this guy and this guy and observe why I needed nine in the output and not eight, because my filter is three wide. And so I, I ended up with this extra layer. In fact, it, I, it, it doesn't have to be plus one. If you, if you allow yourself to go off the edge, then you may have to fill in a few more columns. But the point is the expansion outside of the edge effects is still by an integer value, which is a stride. And then you would stride down by two over here in this case, and then repeat the same operation and go all the way to the bottom. And the resulting map is going to be larger than the original map. So, so again, the, the actual computational operations are very straightforward, as you can see, right? And so if I were to write code, that's easy. I'm going to be initializing the output map at zeros, the Z map at zeros. And I'm literally just performing the operations that I just saw, except that I'm going to be striding forward by this B, which is the stride in this case. Right? Questions? No. OK. So how do you modify this code to compute derivatives when you're going backwards? Anybody want to take a guess? What would you do, do here? This is exactly the same as what we did for the standard convolution, right? I don't need to change any of the code. I can change this, keep the same code. All I would do is to take this last equation, flip it around to get the derivatives, to get derivatives with respect to, Z, to y and the derivatives with respect to w, right? So straightforward. Now, once again, you can call this it's called a transpose convolution. And it's called a transpose convolution because it turns out that even a 2D scan can be thought of as these NLPs, right? We've seen this. It doesn't matter how many, how many uh, layers you set, uh, you what, how many dimensions you have. It's just a hierarchy of NLPs. Every perceptron, so, so every layer is connected to a bunch of neurons underneath, and there's a weights matrix. So when you have shrinking layers, you have uh, you have weights matrices in this modified representation which are broader than they're tall. And if it's expanding, then they're going to be taller than they're broad. So they look like transpositions of one another. Right? Yeah? 
Yeah. That's exactly yes. Why is it better to use expanding convolutions? You're going to so uh, there's nothing magical, right? You could. This is just a, this is just as far as the network is concerned, it's just a structure. But the specific instance where this actually ends up being useful is when you're doing something like uh, auto-associative networks. It's also sometimes called a deconvolution. So think of it this way: I have some image. I want to I, have, I want to compute a reduced dimensional representation of the image, but then I want to go back and reconstruct the image from it. So now I've gone down, then I have to go back up, right? So in those cases, you're going to need expansions, and you'll encounter them. There's another thing that one has to worry about. CNNs are shift invariant. We said we don't care whether the flower is in the top left or the bottom right. We want to find it. What about other kinds of invariants? Can I have rotation invariants? Can I have scaling invariants? Can I have reflection invariants, right? I don't care if it's an upside down flower or a, or, or a proper flower flower, right? An upside up flower or an upside down flower. And uh, how can you actually introduce this kind of invariance into this entire uh, uh, architecture? Now to see how that is done, let's go back and look at the basic operation. The basic operation that we performed was this, right? You, so I drew this somewhere. So you had your L minus 1th layer, right? And then you have your filter, which is just a tube. And to compute the output in a particular map at a particular location, you can think of this filter as being originally positioned at the top left. You shifted the filter to sit at this location, right? You shifted the filter to sit at this location and then computed an inner product. So in terms of operations, what really happens when you're trying to compute the output at a location ij for the s plane is that you shift the filter to the ijth location and then compute a inner product and voila, you get the corresponding value, right? What is a shift? A shift is a transformation, right? There's nothing magical about shifting. Any transformation is perfectly okay. So here's what I can do. I can take my filter, I can transform it, and then shift it. And that's going to give me a new kind of map, right? So I can say I'm going to be scanning for vertical flowers, which means that I have a vertical flower pattern. Then I will rotate my flower by 45 degrees. Then I will scan with the rotated flowers which means I'm looking for scanning for the same flower, but now rotated by 45 degrees. Then I take the flower pattern and I invert it, I scan with it. And I'm going to be scanning for inverted flowers. Then I take my flower and expand it, I scan with it, right? Each of these is a different transform of my basic pattern. So in this case, I've just said I've rotated by 45 degrees. So what you're doing, the actual operation you're gonna perform, now there are two different planes, output planes being computed. One is with the original filter. The other is with the rotated filter, where you've rotated the same filter. The filter hasn't changed. You've rotated the filter by 45 degrees. You've shifted it to the correct, appropriate location, and then you're computing an output, right? Nothing magical about rotations. Basically, you can have as many transformations as you want. So I can take my original filter, and I can produce all of those transforms. Each of those guys over there is a different version of the filter. One is the original filter, the other is rotated by five, de five degrees, the other is rotated by 10 degrees, the one is scaled by, by 15 degrees, one is rotated and, you know, I mean 15%, one is rotated and scaled. I'm going to have many different variants of the same filter, and each of them is going to produce a map, right? And I would do this for every single filter. So if I had two filters, I'm going to have two each filter results in an entire set of, of transformed filters which produce maps, right? If I have two filters, so if I have two filters and if I have T transforms, I'm going to end up with two T effective filters derived from only two of these guys. Each of them is scanning the input to produce a map. And so if I would just write a code, it's very straightforward. 
Uh, this is your standard one layer of a CNN, right? You're scanning for each filter, you're scanning, and then you're computing the output. Here's what will happen now. For each filter, you're going to go over all possible transformations of this filter, which includes rotation, scalings, whatever. You are enumerating them. The key here is that the number of transforms is not infinite. It's a finite set of transforms that you decide on. You're basically just saying, instead of having four filters in this layer in my CNN, I have 4,000. That number 1,000 is yours. It's 1,000 transforms that you introduced, right? And then you're going to be scanning after transforming with each of these guys. And so if I have four filters and 1,000 transforms, how many output maps am I going to get? Anyone? Everybody's asleep, right? Good, so let me pick on someone. If I have four filters and a thousand transforms, how many output maps am I going to get? Four thousand. One for a thousand for each, right? Each filter is going to be transformed by each of these thousand guys. And so the next map is going to be four thousand deep. Other than that, everything else is exactly the same. You two guys, you should turn off your uh, tablets. You. <laughs> mm, yes. OK. Derivatives, you're going to be computing the derivatives. But then if I want to compute the derivative of a particular filter, it has to come through all the transformed versions of the filter. right? And I won't get into the details of it. But then every time you transform something, you need some way of assigning a particular location on the original filter to each of the transformed, ver transformed positions. right? or at least you need some kind of a map going backwards. But, uh, but, but these transforms are a, lot, are a lot like pooling. You can think of these as different kinds of pooling in some sense, right? or, or equivalence. So the story so far, uh, CNNs are shifting in various neural networks. All, the, all that's fine. The key piece is that the models can be easily modified to include invariance to transforms other than shifts. right? And yes. So for transform filters, how would you do that? If you transform, if you rotate the filter by five degrees, how can you make this modification? So you've rotated, you're going to be computing. So you have a cube. It's still uh, typically after rotating it, you're going to have to come up. You're basically, you'd be resampling it so that the whole thing can now again be arranged as a cube, right? Just as you, try, you can rotate an image. And there's the whole process. Imagine when I, when, I, when I rotated that image, that image is still a grid on my screen, is it not? Oh, okay. Right? So you just recomputed new values, that's all. But the, idea is, but the idea is very straightforward. There's nothing magical, right? It gets tedious. I don't like, recommend it, but uh, it's doable. Now, yeah. You can rotate it by any amount, right? If you rotate it by any amount, you don't retain the exact values. You're going to have to recompute. Okay. Your standard image processing you know, techniques will tell you how much, what the values are, right? But, yes? What are the advantages of rotating the, or transforming the filters rather than transforming the inputs and changing them? You could do that. They're strictly equivalent. But think of scaling, right? So well, firstly, the input is much larger than the filter. And so when I scale it or rotate it, you're going to be maintaining very large uh, sized uh, things. And uh, secondly, if I scale it, you know, what exactly, what exactly does it mean, right? Scaling the filter is a more uh, intuitive operation, correct? But yes, this two are strictly equivalent. Now, there was no, yes. You could, but the whole point is that uh, you want the filters to automatically learn how to also deal with these transformations. And so they wouldn't be optimal in that sense. Right. Now, final bit. Let's loop back to the beginning, right? Um, we started off with the desire to identify this picture as containing a flower, regardless of the position of the flower, or regardless of the class of the object. We wanted to identify the class. But we started off saying, okay, I'm going to scan for a flower. This means that if you detected a flower, there was a notion of a location of a flower. That, no, that notion has been lost. 
So how can we recover it? How do I know where the flower is? It turns out it's very straightforward to do. So the standard technique is you use the train your whole network and if someone has bothered to actually give you training data with the locations of the objects in it, you not only have a predictor, so the final flat convolution layer which gets flattened, that output now gets sent to two classifiers. One of them tells you if a, which class of object has been detected. And the second, this is assuming that there's only one instance of any class of objects. The second is actually going to give you the locations of the four corners of the bounding box of the object. So here, these four values, this is an XY, this is an XY, this is an XY, and this is an XY, right? So eight values completely specify this bounding box. And so now I can actually have two subnets. One of them operates on these features and gives you the class output. The other one operates on these and gives you these eight values. And I can learn to simultaneously predict the location and the object itself. And uh, uh, of course, in this case now when I train the network, that network must be trained to simultaneously optimize both objectives. So the actual divergence that you'll get is going to be some of the divergence from the of the divergences from the two classifiers with whatever weighting you want to choose uh, to assign relative importance to the two. But then once you figure you can actually do this, you can actually, so now something, we've introduced an interesting notion over here. We've introduced the notion of multiple task learning and that I have a single feature representation being learned by the classifier, but that's being used for multiple tasks. In this case, the task one is classification, task two is location, right? But once you agree that you can actually have multiple tasks, the second task can be anything, right? So here, for instance, the second task is give me the locations of the 18 joints on the person, 14 joints on the person. And now you can actually get your pose estimator. So first, detect if there's a person on the image. And second, find me all the key points which completely specify the pose so I can connect them up. So I'm kind of out of time, so I'll stop right here. Uh, just one final bit. What exactly do the filters learn? We spoke of filters. We have a hierarchy of representations. When you have a hierarchy of representations, the filters, we said the lower, lowest level filters learn something, the higher level filters learn something more complex, and so on. And uh, this was a slide we had very early in the lecture, right? But then if you go back and actually analyze the kinds of patterns that the different filters learn, here's a, here's a I, figure, I forget where I got this from. Uh, this, was, this was actually given to me by, by one of the TAs, so I'll have to find out where he got it from, attribution. Several layers in a CNN for, which has been trained for different tasks. The leftmost CNN has been trained to recognize faces. The one in the center has been trained to recognize you know, cars, or actually no. So this is just the same CNN for different kinds of objects, I believe. But regardless, as you see, actually, you, if you see the kinds of patterns that are being found by the higher level filters, the ones at the lowest level filters are simply finding oriented lines. This takes us back, you know, almost a week. The human eye or the mammalian eye, it actually just recognizes oriented lines. And then we sort of compose more complex patterns from it, right? So regardless of whether you're trying to classify faces, cars, elephants, or chairs, the lowermost layer just simply finds oriented lines or simple objects such as these. And the actual patterns, the receptive fields for the different neurons as you go up the network begin resembling the specific classes more and more as you go up through the network which is kind of interesting, right? Uh, there was a nice paper some years ago about when uh, they first trained a very large network for image classification and they found that there was a neuron which coded for cats or something, which is very similar to what happens in the human brain. You have a, a Jennifer Aniston neuron as we discussed this, right? Or you could. Anyway, I'll stop here. Uh, the uh, rest of the uh, information is on the slides. We will, I'm not gonna continue with CNN, so please go over the slides. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I will have a uh, link on Piazza for Errata on, on today's slides, and there are several. Please post. And if you have any questions about everything, anything we've covered, please post on Piazza. Okay.
Thank you.